So it's almost impossible to put into accurate terms just how massive the Imperium of Man truly is. Now it's said that it controls around a million worlds, and the amount of human souls that owe their allegiance to the God Emperor in one form or another is seemingly uncountable. Now amongst the quintillions of individuals, there exists a pretty exotic menagerie of different warrior cults, factions honed in the fires of war, each delivering a unique style of death and destruction. From the foot-slogging infantry of the Imperial Guard to the techno-magi cults of the Adeptus Mechanicus, from the fiery religious wrath of the Sisters of Battle to the sons of the Primarchs themselves, the Emperor's Angels, the Space Marines. Every faction within the Imperium has its own unique strengths and weaknesses, and each play an integral part in the protection of mankind from the forces of chaos and the limitless Xenos threats. But what if I was to tell you that there existed a faction that made them all look like children playing soldiers by comparison? One that seemingly had no weakness. That these dudes were warriors literally crafted by the hands of God himself. Now what if I was to tell you that there existed a cast of literally perfect soldiers that excelled in just about everything? That they had no equal in combat and were masters of not just every form of warfare, but seemingly every academic pursuit as well? that they displayed unquestionable and unshakable loyalty, literally ingrained in them at the genetic level, and that each one was so perfect and powerful that their value could only be measured in entire worlds. And what if I was to tell you that this godlike army of anime main characters actually spent thousands of years sitting on their hands pretty much doing nothing? Now what if I was to tell you that the greatest army mankind had ever seen, who had the best warriors and the best equipment, spent all of their time guarding a corpse? And for all of their multitudes, the greatest warriors that mankind had ever seen had failed in their single mission. The royal guard of God had allowed him to be mortally wounded, and that this failure brought upon them a shame so deep that we can't even begin to comprehend it. So great was their loss that they spent thousands of years mourning, and they sat idly by their father's corpse, guarding him even in his deathless state. Thousands of years have passed since the day the emperor was placed on the golden throne. And here in the 41st millennium, his 10,000 are needed once again, and they've taken to the stars to bring about a reckoning like never before seen. In war and fire would their rage be absolved, and the sins of their failure washed away in the blood of heretics. Let's talk about the Adeptus Custodes. So what exactly are the Custodians anyways? Now if you're brand new to 40k, I can forgive you for thinking that they're basically just big golden space marines. But comparing a custodian to a space marine is pretty much the equivalent of comparing one of the Astartes to a normal human. A space marine is a thousand times greater than any mortal man. They live for thousands of years and are some of the Imperium's greatest protectors. From their implants that let them recover from almost any injury, their superhuman strength, speed, and endurance, a mind that can process information thousands of times faster than any mortals can, or even the ability to literally spit acid. There is just no comparison between them and mortals. But for all of the Space Marine's enhancements, they are nothing in comparison to the Emperor's Royal Guard. Whereas a Space Marine is designed to be a mass-produced super soldier, the Custodians are each a handcrafted demigod. Whereas each legion of Space Marines had their own specialty and preferred fighting style, the Custodians are versed in all of them. Now on the individual level, a Space Marine is surely not defenseless. However, they are designed to fight as a unit, a phalanx, each one defending the brother at his side, and in a way this multiplies their strength. The Custodians on the other hand are each a one-man army. In combat they were designed to be the death of any being, creature, or foe that may threaten the Emperor or his vision, and thus physical, spiritual, and mental perfection must be absolute in every single candidate, and the aspirants that could not meet these impossible demands would inevitably be cold, or more likely would perish during the process of their creation. And although all that sounds really good, there's a really important fact that differentiates the Custodians from their power-armored cousins. And that is that not a single Custodian has ever fallen to corruption. Now for as hyped up as the Space Marines are in the lore, often being viewed as the pinnacle of creation, 10,000 years ago their resolve was tested, and the legions of the Adeptus Astartes were found wanting. As a resulting betrayal of half of the legions led mankind into the bloodiest civil war it had ever seen. The Horus Heresy was so devastating that even now, 10,000 years later, the Imperium has yet to recover. Worse yet, it has deviated so far from its intended design that it may not ever be possible to fully get back on track. Now every single Stode is an absolute apex predator, and I know I made this comparison before, but I think it's pretty fitting. 
They're basically an entire group of video game main characters. If you're a fan of FromSoft games and you've played Elden Ring, imagine an army made up entirely of Elden Lords. All of their stats maxed out to 99. The custodians demand absolute perfection. Every single one of them is literally a legendary hero in their own right. And interestingly enough to complement this, when the custodians are created, they abandon their birth names and they take up a name fitting of a hero, normally derived from one of the larger-than-life figures of the myths of ancient Terra. Hercules, Achilles, or Odysseus, just to name a few. Now, the custodians are awarded additional names as they advance through their career. Whether those names be bestowed upon them by their brothers for acts of great bravery, victory over impossible foes, or any other manner of great deed. Now, these names are etched upon the inside of their armor, or in some instances, the custodians will have them transcribed microscopically onto their own bones. And this is because traditionally these names are meant to be kept secret, known only to the custodian himself and his closest allies. So the custodians have been around for a long time, longer than the Imperium itself. Their first known appearance was in the year M29, during a period known as the Unification Wars. So we can without a doubt say that the Stodes were at least 12,000 years old but there are whispers of their existence long before this time, as the 9th edition codex mentions that one source of their origins are crude cave etchings from an unspecified location in time. Considering the Emperor was created in the year 8000 BC, it's very possible that he had begun experimenting with genetic engineering long before this. So maybe the Stodes are even far older than that. Although admittedly that is just me being wildly speculative, if I had to guess, I would assume that the Emperor's experiments probably didn't take place until around the year 25,000 during a period known as the Age of Strife or Old Night. And even still, it's kind of impossible to tell when exactly his experiments would have began to bear fruit. So it's probably safe to assume that they're around 12,000 years old. Now the means by which an individual is turned into a custodian is a closely guarded secret. Recruits are taken when they are incredibly young, even more so than the aspirants of the Space Marines. It's stated in the 8th and 9th edition codex that they are no older than late infancy. However, I have to admit there is a slight contradiction here, as there was a custodian named Ra Endymion, who was documented as having been around four years old when he was recruited. Although, like with most things in 40k lore, you will never find a hard and fast rule in this universe. There will always be deviations, but it's important to not mistake those one-off examples for the norm. These infants are often taken from noble families, many of whom consider it a great honor to give up their son to become a custodian. It is stated that sometimes entire generations are offered up at the same time. Their induction into the halls of the Imperial Palace is met with parades and cheers from onlooking crowds that sing prayers to them as they are escorted inside. Now, originally it was said that the Emperor's hand was involved in the creation of every single custodian warrior, but whereas he's been entombed upon the Golden Throne for 10,000 years, this obviously is not an option anymore. The arcane gene manipulating process is still a closely guarded secret, and it's known only to a select few. Yet new custodians are still able to be produced, and even though they are commonly referred to as the 10,000, there are rumors that this number may no longer be accurate, and that it is simply still used as a cover-up to keep the true extent of the custodian's power hidden. Whether this is true or not, we can't really say. However, it is apparent that the Emperor had a large collection of genetic engineers, biologists, and artificers under his employment, even when he used to be directly involved in their creation. Now, it's believed that the information used to create a new custodian has been passed down for thousands of years, and by all accounts, it's still pretty damn effective when it comes to producing new ones. Now, like with most things in the Imperium, whether or not the individuals that are responsible for making the custodians of today actually know what they're doing or they're just following a step-by-step -step guide written down on an ancient holy bar napkin. Who can say? Unfortunately, we as the audience also aren't really given too much information on it. It's meant to be super mysterious. However, we do know a couple of things, such as how the custodians aren't given any kind of implants like the space marines are. Anything they have within them that distinguishes them from mortal men is grown within them at a genetic level. And to bring a bunch of noble babies up to demigod level requires a complete breakdown and reforging of just about everything about them. Every single custodian must be the peak of physical and mental perfection. They must have a mind on par with God himself as to be his counselors. They must have the battle prowess and reflexes of a legendary hero as to be the God Emperor's warrior executioners, wardens, and any other physical role they may require. They must have innate talent in every conceivable subject and discipline. And to create such a perfect being is a monumental undertaking for any scientist assigned to the project. It is such a strenuous and difficult undertaking that only the most accomplished of individuals are ever assigned to the task. 
and it is said that unlike the Space Marines whose production is made to resemble an assembly line, the process for creating every single custodian is unique to the individual. The end result is a perfect specimen, unlike any that have ever existed. They are immortal, incorruptible, and incredibly intelligent. To put it in the most simplest terms, if a space marine is a hundred times greater than a normal man, then a custodian is a hundred times greater than even the best of the space marines. And oh yeah, just as a quick side note, even the most powerful custodian that ever lived, Constantine Valdor, doesn't even begin to remotely come close to the god emperor in either power or intellect. That's like trying to compare a molehill to Mount Everest. But anyways, I'm getting off track. Above all else, the custodians represent discipline incarnate, their duty to the emperor the only thing that matters to them, so much so that it is literally ingrained into their biology. That and through a healthy dose of lifelong rigorous indoctrination and psychoconditioning. The result of this combination is a sense of loyalty and obedience that is generated at a subconscious level. To question or doubt is literally impossible for them. But this is only where their training begins, as a custodian must be trained in every conceivable form of fighting and warfare, and not to mention pretty much everything else. The custodians are more than just warriors, they're scholars and philosophers, doctors and engineers. These guys basically have a PhD in every academic subject you can think of. They must be diplomats, politicians, generals, and council members. They must be able to fill pretty much any role that is required of them. Needless to say, a lot is asked of the custodians. But honestly, this makes a lot of sense, and it's for three major reasons. The first is that as the Emperor's bodyguards, they had to be the death of anything that could possibly threaten him. So they had to be ready for anything and to fight the strongest foes imaginable. The second is that they weren't just his bodyguards, they were his closest allies. They were his friends, he confided in them, trusted them, and conversed with them on a daily basis. Now it is said that he knew every single one of them by name and on a personal level. In the 41st millennium, the emperor is considered to be a god by the majority of mankind. But even if he wasn't, it is clear that he is potentially the most powerful and intelligent individual that has ever existed. The intellect of a single human is but a drop of rain compared to the vast ocean of wisdom and knowledge the Emperor possessed. To be able to even hold a conversation with such a being, let alone offer him guidance and wisdom, requires an unbelievably capable mind. And this is definitely some personal bias seeping in here, but I think this is unbelievably badass. Like to me, that's one of the coolest things about the Custodians, that they aren't just these crazy badass golden warriors, but they're also unbelievably wise and intelligent. So much so, that they can give advice to God himself. Now don't get me wrong, everything else about them is super cool as well, and we'll definitely get into all their dope weapons and armor and stuff like that, but I'm just kind of blown away by how smart these dudes are. And speaking of intelligence, the custodians are given information that would make a normal man descend into madness. They are trusted with the dark truths of the universe, that were only known to the emperor and a select few. The custodians were closer to the emperor than anyone else, with the exception of possibly Malkador. Even his own sons were kept at a distance and only told what he believed they needed to know. The relationship between the emperor and the custodians is complicated, just like pretty much every relationship he ever had. On one hand, the custodians were basically tools designed for a specific purpose in the emperor's grand plans. But on the other, they were his closest confidants, friends, and basically an extension of himself. Now even though the Emperor has been incapacitated for over 10,000 years, the Custodians still see themselves as being loyal only to him. And this is a very important distinction. They are not loyal to the Imperium like everyone else is. They don't even necessarily consider themselves part of the Imperium. In the novel The Emperor's Legion, there is a really interesting conversation between one of the High Lords of Terra and a Custodian named Valerian. The custodian informs him that, quote, we are not part of your Imperium. We involve ourselves within it only if we deem it his will that demands it. And this is actually really interesting. It represents that the custodians view loyalty to the Emperor and the Imperium as two completely separate things, even though they're often kind of intrinsically linked together, meaning that they're possibly further removed from the Imperium's hierarchical systems than even the Adeptus Mechanicus or the Inquisition. And speaking of comparing them to other factions, the Custodians actually have some pretty interesting views on Space Marines. You see, in the same novel, there is a scene where the Grey Knights show up on Terra to assist the Custodians after Cadia fell. Without getting into major details or spoilers on this book, there is a moment where the Custodian from before is watching the Grey Knights arrive. He ruminates on the differences between them and his thoughts are pretty interesting. He acknowledges that they're both creations of the Emperor, 
the Grey Knights more than any other legion as they were made using the Emperor's gene seed. And although there is an ocean of differences between them, separated by thousands of years of history, culture, and purpose, he notes that there's a lot of similarities as well. For example, they're both experts in killing demons. And for all intents and purposes, they're both immune to corruption. The Grey Knights and the Custodians both also control massive repositories of demonic lore. The Custodians with their Tower of Hegemon and the Grey Knights Librarium on Titan. And at their very core, they are both fundamental elements in the great battle against the Arch Enemy. Yet despite all their similarities, they're still incredibly different. For one, Valerian admits that the 10,000 are not an army. They were not originally designed to be primarily warriors. They were created for something far greater. You see, the Custodians were made to be in service to a galaxy that never came to be. The Emperor's dream of a perfect utopia, his Imperium, went up in smoke the day that the Chaos Traders arrived on Terra. The Custodians were not designed exclusively to be a fighting force, despite the fact that they now kind of fill that role in the 41st millennium. This is not true of the Grey Knights. They were designed with a singular purpose, to kill demons. The Sigilites Legion was created only to fight the Arch Enemy. Yet despite their differences, Valerian remarks that him and his cousins both look at the Emperor as their progenitor, as they were both derived from his own genetic material. And in this way, the Custodians may be closer to the Grey Knights, at least physically and in spirit, than any other Imperial faction. Despite this, he claims that though he does not personally share these views, many of his Custodian brothers look at the Grey Knights as nothing more than a variant of Space Marine. They see the Astartes as a useful yet unpredictable tool in the Imperium's conquest. As the resolve of the Emperor's Angels had been tested once before, and they failed. They believe that given enough time, all Space Marines will inevitably fail in the same manner. That the Grey Knights could as well. And because of this, even though they fight side by side and for all intents and purposes are definitely allies, the Custodians don't really trust them. And considering what happened with the Horus Heresy and what's happening now with Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade, I mean, can you blame them? But anyways, that's enough about Space Marines. This is supposed to be a Custodes video. So let's talk about some of their Imperial duties. Now potentially one of the most important duties of the Custodian is guarding the Emperor himself. And I can kind of understand why, considering that they're literally known as his bodyguards. Now the individuals that are assigned to such a task are known as the Companions. There's about 300 of them at any given time, each one having been hand-selected by the Captain General himself. To be one of the Companions is potentially the greatest honor a Custodian can achieve. These individuals stand by the Emperor's side within the Imperial Palace for insanely long periods of time. They're given no food, no rest, and I'm convinced these guys don't even blink. The entire time they are primed and ready to spring into action at any moment, with no hesitation. One such custodian that was assigned to this task was named Astrin Kalos, and he served in such a manner for an entire century before being finally rotated out. And even if a custodian doesn't manage to last this long, switching places with one of their brothers isn't considered dishonorable. It's just them being practical. If a custodian falls below 100% perfection, even just to like 99.9%, .9%, then that means they're not operating at the astronomical performance levels demanded of the companions, and they must take time to recover. The custodians are perfect in all ways, but they're not machines. They do eventually require rest and sustenance. Within the Imperial Palace, the Custodians also play the role of the Guardians and Jailers of the vaults deep beneath it. These vaults contain the true horrors of the universe. It is here that the horrifyingly destructive relics of the Dark Age of Technology are stored, hidden deep within the Earth under metric tons of Adamite slab and runic seals. Now there isn't a source that tells us just how large these vaults are, but considering that the Imperial Palace is said to be the size of a small nation, we can assume that this underground labyrinth is pretty vast. Whether these monstrous creations be that of mankind's design or unholy or even Xenos relics of immense and terrible power, the nature of such objects is a closely guarded secret. But it's not just terrifying relics and machines that are held here. The vaults also operate as a jail. Just listen to a couple of the names of the creatures and individuals that are held in these vaults. Subject 11, One of the Fell, and It That Craves. These are but three of thousands of horrific alien and demonic entities. So it's basically like the entire SCP Foundation is underneath the Imperial Palace. It is said that just learning about some of these things could cause a non-augmented human to lose their mind and descend into madness. Patrolling such a place is to be constantly in a sense of dread and foreboding. The containers and cells here are completely dark, so no one can see inside them, and no sound can escape. But even still, 
The ominous presence of this place is absolutely overwhelming. It's all of the darkest and most horrifying things in the entire galaxy gathered into a single place. If me or you were to try to walk around in there, our brains would probably melt out of our ears. But to the custodians that watch over it, it is their sacred duty to make sure these things never again see the light of day. Now the custodians that are assigned to this duty are part of a shield host known as the Shadow Keepers. It is them and them alone that have access to the vaults and have buried deep in their subconscious the knowledge needed to disengage the locks and warding sigils. And although they technically have the power to open them, they know this knowledge can never be utilized. That this can never happen, as it would be the death of mankind and potentially the galaxy as a whole. And I don't think these dudes get nearly enough credit, as the companions are often heralded as the greatest of all custodians, as they are permitted to stand guard by the Emperor's side. But those dudes are constantly bathed in his holy light. The stodes that are down here, they have to stand unflinching for decades at a time, surrounded by a literal aura of dread and misery. Although admittedly, to be fair, standing in the presence of the Emperor for an extended period of time is by all accounts just as intense but kinda on the opposite end of the spectrum. So maybe both jobs just suck equally. I mean, think about it. If being in here for a minute would cause a human to go mad, yet these guys can stand perfectly still, never wavering, for 50 or 60 years without even blinking. That's ridiculously impressive. It is a true demonstration of their unbelievable mental fortitude. But even they are not wholly unaffected by the experience. If one of the Shadow Keepers is rotated out of service, individuals that knew him before can immediately tell that they have been forever changed by the experience. They are far more alert, aggressive, and mistrusting of others. It is said they never speak of what they see down there, and thus it's difficult for others to relate to them, even other custodians. This shield host has more custodian wardens than any other. These wardens are given access to truly ancient and esoteric custodian weaponry that is said to be an absolute last resort if one of these things was to break free. So these relics are undoubtedly powerful. So needless to say, the jobs the custodians have to do are pretty intense. So what type of training do they have to endure? Now the custodians are always honing and perfecting their skills. And considering that they don't age and live impossibly long lives, they've gathered a pretty enormous amount of experience. Their training can take hundreds of different forms, such as the elaborately staged battles in the Hallucinarium, some of which can be the size of full-scale invasions of Terra. And they're not just in there for a few hours, some of these stage campaigns can last years or even decades. So even though many of them have never left the Imperial Palace, they are prepared for just about anything they could possibly encounter. One of the most famous ways the custodians train is through these things known as the Blood Games. And this is where a single custodian will take the role of an invader or an assassin and attempt to breach the Imperial Palace. The ultimate goal is to reach the Golden Throne. Now this is done to test the limits of the palace's defense systems. The custodian can enter in any way they see fit and at any time, and the other custodians must stop them. Not only is this an incredibly valuable experience and a stellar training session, but if the custodian is successful, it serves the additional purpose of exposing weaknesses in their defenses. Now without getting into too much detail, it may actually have been the Primarch of the Alpha Legion, Alpharius, that started this tradition as he was the first Primarch to be located and brought back to the Imperial Palace. His existence, however, was kept secret from everyone but the Emperor and Malkador. At one point, Alpharius had left and tried to re-infiltrate the palace. He made it all the way to the Golden Throne and set himself up in a sniper position, ready to assassinate the Emperor. Now, he definitely wasn't going to actually kill him, he was trying to prove a point. But Constantine Valdor, the acting Captain General of the Custodians of that era, and one of the most badass dudes who ever lived, discovered him and launched himself up into the rafters after him. It was up there that Alpharius and Valdor engaged in a brutal and fast-paced melee battle. Alpharius barely even able to hold back the relentless and lightning-fast strikes of the Captain General. He was wrath incarnate. Eventually their battle spilled out onto the roof and Alpharius surrendered. He told Valdor of the purpose of his infiltration and revealed that if he wanted to kill the Emperor, he could have already done it, as along the way he had hijacked all of the missile and anti-air systems on the Imperial Palace and at any point, could have blown the Emperor's plane out of the sky. Meanwhile, during this entire conversation, Valdor has a crackling guardian spear at Alpharius' throat. This entire event took place in Alpharius' Primarch novel, so you can check that out if you want to know more about it. Now, when it comes to actual war, the Custodians are more prepared than pretty much any other faction. Not only are they equipped with the best weapons and equipment the entire million worlds of the Imperium can produce, but their authority is so absolute 
that they can commandeer anything or anyone they could possibly want or need for a future engagement. It is said that some battleships have been pulled into service by the custodians so many times that for all intents and purposes, they have become part of their order. And no one but the Emperor himself can tell the 10,000 what to do. Even Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, son of the Emperor and the current head of the Imperium, can't order them to do anything. He can only make a request. Now, a lot of times when you're reading 40k novels, you'll see an Inquisitor show up and basically commandeer everything around them. As the Inquisitors exist outside of the command structures of the Imperium, and their authority supersedes literally everything you can think of. Even the Chapter Masters or the entirety of the Grey Knights is forced to bend a knee to them. However, if the Custodians were capable of humor, I'm sure they would laugh in the face of any pretentious Inquisitor that tried to make a demand of them. However, that being said, a custodian would probably never do that. They're way too smart and politically minded. A custodian would never directly antagonize an ally, even if they were being arrogant or particularly unreasonable. Now, the custodians don't just take what they need from others. They have plenty of their own ships as well. And this is because sometimes a threat comes in so fast and unexpectedly that they would have no time to commandeer any other vessels. So they do have a fleet of their own that's mostly made out of falchion class battleships. Now, when it comes to the organization of the Custodians into a fighting force, there's two particular examples that show up a lot. You have what are known as shield companies and a shield host. A shield company is basically what happens when a bunch of Custodians are drawn together for a particular type of engagement. The shield captain normally determines what type of units will be critical in the upcoming battle. The shield captain may choose to bring a whole bunch of Terminators if they're going to be doing boarding actions or the shield captain may utilize a whole bunch of Dawn Eagle jet bikes if they're going to be fighting on an open battlefield and speed is going to be critically important. There are literally hundreds of different combinations of the multitude of different units the custodians have access to. So needless to say, there's lots of different types of shield companies that could potentially be made. Now, the major thing about them is they're not a permanent fighting force and will often be dissolved after whatever engagement they were designed for has ended. However, the shield captain can always call upon those individuals once again to reform the same shield company. Now, a shield host is a far rarer event. And it's basically when you take a whole bunch of shield companies and merge them together into one cohesive army. The entirety of the shield host being led by each of the company's corresponding shield captains. And there's no bickering or rivalries or anything like that. Shared leadership is totally normal under the circumstances and the various shield captains will openly divulge secrets and wisdoms to their brothers. And those shield hosts are normally incredibly large. Sometimes they can be even smaller than a single shield company. But considering that every single stowed is a one-man army, this actually could make sense. Now, when it comes to the arms and armor of the custodians, no expense is too great. Their equipment is insanely valuable and rare, but they must be equipped to deal with any conceivable threat, no matter what form it may take whether that be from one of the galaxy's various and voracious alien species that would bring death upon mankind, the forces of the arch enemy that would see the galaxy and everything in it set aflame, or even threats from inside the kingdom of man itself. They must be ready to deal with potentially any scenario at any moment. So needless to say, they're given access to some pretty badass stuff. Their signature golden armor is crafted from a material known as Aramite. This is an incredibly rare material that is far denser and more protective than Ceramite the material that the Space Marine's power armor is made from. For context, it's literally the same stuff the God Emperor's personal suit of armor was crafted from. With the exception of Rogel Dorn, I don't even think the Primarch suits are made out of material this valuable. So does that mean every single custodian has a suit of armor that's better than that of the Primarchs? I'm genuinely curious on this one and I don't actually know the answer. I've tried to research it, I've looked it up a whole bunch of times, but I haven't found an answer. So if you know the answer to this, let me know in the comments. Now, the senses of a custodian are heightened to absolutely obscene levels, but they're elevated even higher by an incredibly advanced sensory system that is built into every suit of armor. These sensors constantly scan everything around them and can alert them to even the most subtle of changes, even a speck of dust that's moving a little weird several yards away from them. This makes it basically impossible to sneak up on a custodian. They are also equipped with powerful refractor field generators that offer them even further protection and can allow them to tank anti-vehicle rounds like it's nothing. Just like the custodian himself, his armor is a work of art that is handcrafted and tailored to the individual. Even the Space Marines don't have access to something like this, as again, they and their equipment are meant to be mass-produced and replaced. The loss of a Space Marine in his gear 
from the Imperium's macro point of view, is expected and anticipated. The same is not true of a custodian. Everything about them and the equipment they use is one of a kind. Now the weapons the Stodes bring to battle are unbelievably valuable and expertly crafted to a ludicrous degree. And these weapons are not just crafted by a single master, but entire generations of such people. Their entire lives and bloodlines dedicated only to the production of Custodes' weapons. The lineage of these artisans dates back thousands of years. There were even subcults of the Adeptus Mechanicus whose entire purpose was to produce a single working piece, a single gear or component for a spear or a sword. In that sense, each of these blades is the accumulation of multiple generations of knowledge and expertise. It is the skills and wisdom of thousands of god-tier artisans and master engineers distilled into a single weapon. To even attempt to put a value on such a thing is a ludicrous notion. To further emphasize just how good this stuff is, it is stated that never once has a piece of custodian equipment ever failed in 12,000 years. They must be as perfect in every conceivable way as their wielders. This goes for their arms and armor, Dawn Eagle jet bikes, land raiders, and every other piece of equipment in their armory. And when it comes to actual combat, the custodians fight like no other force in the Imperium. Instead of operating in tight-knit unit formations, they fight like a group of individual heroes. So whereas the Guard or the Space Marines will utilize disciplined battalions and fighting formations in order to multiply their strengths, every single one of the Custodians is basically an OP main character. Whereas a single Space Marine may be able to meet their equivalent in battle on open terms, 10 of them working in a Phalanx formation may be able to take hundreds of such individuals. This is not how the 10,000 fight. Every one of the Custodians is an apex individual capable of fighting in any style or filling any battlefield role. They can be trusted to act completely independently without any need for following orders. I've used this example in previous videos, but I think it's really important, so I'm going to quickly go over it here as well. In the novel The First Heretic, the character Argyll Tall of the Wordbearers Legion, first of the Gal Vorbeck, remarks that whereas the Space Marines are like a pack of wolves, fundamentally designed to operate in formation with each other, the Custodians are lions, each an apex predator in their own right. They can switch tactics and fighting styles in less than a heartbeat at a subconscious level always fighting in the most optimum use of their skills at any given moment. This means a squad of custodians is unbelievably flexible, and does not need to waste time or reaction speed in communicating his goals or intentions. On a subconscious level, they each fight at the absolute peak performance in any given moment. Now this isn't to say they don't utilize leadership, as custodian military detachments are often led by what is known as a shield captain, potentially the most visible form of authority within the ranks of the custodians. Watching them fight has got to be absolutely breathtaking, as they can each cut down hundreds of enemies in a whirling bloodbath of blade and bolter fire. They don't think, they don't hesitate, they just act. There's another really interesting scene in the Emperor's Legion novel where the custodians are fighting off a whole bunch of demons that have attempted to invade Terra. As the battle draws to its close, the demons retreat, as they have begun to dematerialize. The custodian that was fighting them is completely stone-faced and emotionless. He watches the enemies run away, and he has this moment where he's experiencing a feeling that, in his many centuries of service, he's never felt before. He doesn't exactly know how to describe it, but it's like the enemy retreating has robbed him of something. Something very important to him, but he can't quite make sense of it. He theorizes that he wasn't done. He wanted more. He was not ready to stop killing. But this isn't how the custodians think. They don't really feel emotions like this, and they don't want for anything other than to serve. So even for him and his limitless intelligence, he's utterly confused by this. Now I want to talk briefly about a moment in the custodians' history that I think is pretty important. But as this video has already run pretty long, I'm not going to bog this video down by just listing off pretty much everything they've ever done, as I feel other creators have already done stuff like this, and they've done it a lot better than I can. Instead, I'd like to leave you with a moment that to me is an incredibly important piece of their history that doesn't really get talked about nearly enough. And that is what happened between the Custodians and the Thunder Warriors. Now, no one knows when or how the Custodians came to be, but we do know that they've been around for an incredibly long time, having existed since before the Imperium. They came even before the Thunder Warriors, which were basically like proto-Space Marines. Now, the Thunder Warriors will eventually get their own video, but for right now, the major thing that you need to understand is why they're not around anymore. You see, they were an early attempt at mass-produced super soldiers, and unlike the Custodians, who were created to be perfect in every conceivable way, the Thunder Warriors basically took all of the worst elements of humanity and cranked them up to 11. 
They were unbelievably aggressive, and as time went on, they became more and more difficult to control. Now, it is believed that they were an early attempt at cutting corners in gene forging, as producing something like a custodian took an incredibly large amount of time. So the emperor and his infant imperium needed a way to produce soldiers much quicker. The problem was, the genetics of the Thunder Warriors would eventually begin to deteriorate over a certain amount of time, the risk of complications increasing with every year of service. There are some that say that this was not a mistake at all, that this was by the Emperor's design, that he saw the Thunder Warriors as useful tools for uniting the planet of Terra during the Unification Wars, but he had never intended for them to be the next step in the construction of the Imperium, and that they had simply run their course. Only the Emperor knows the truth, but maybe it was a combination of these factors. What we do know is that eventually the Emperor gave the order for the Thunder Warriors to be wiped out, and the Custodians obeyed. At the Battle of Mount Ararat, the Custodians obliterated all of them with no mercy and no emotion. Every Thunder Warrior present was cut down, and their eradication completely covered up. Now, there was a group of Thunder Warriors led by a proto-Primarch named Oshitan, who showed up at the Imperial Palace and demanded that Valdor and the Custodians answer for their crimes. And just a quick clarification here, although the term Primarch is used for a Thunder Warrior leader, there was no real difference between him and his battle brothers other than just experience. Anyways, what followed was a great standoff where neither side refused to back down, and a great battle inevitably broke out between them. There were far less Custodians than the Thunder Warriors, so despite the Stode's incredible skill, the Thunder Warriors may have stood a chance. However, this would inevitably serve as the first battle for the Thunder Warriors' replacements. Reinforcements came from behind, an army of them in black armor bearing only the symbol of a winged sword. These were the very first Space Marines, the First Legion, and would one day be known as the Dark Angels. Together, Custodian and Space Marine fought the Thunder Warriors and ended their era permanently. And there's actually a pretty sad conversation that takes place with Valdor and Oshitan during this engagement, as these two are pretty much locked in conflict the entire time the battle is going on. Oshitan tells Valdor that he now sees that the Emperor saw him and his men as disposable, that everything and everyone that he created was disposable, that they were nothing but tools and the Emperor didn't even care about them or see them as people. He said this, however, wasn't true of the Custodians. He knew that they would outlive them because, unlike the Thunder Warriors, they were irreplaceable that these Space Marines would fight for them now, but one day, when it was too late for them to see it coming, the Custodians would come for them as well, just as they had the Thunder Warriors. Valdor disagrees with him and says that him and the Custodians are disposable as well, that they are tools and that is their purpose. They should be used and disregarded when they're no longer needed. Oshitan questions if he even knows what purpose is anymore. Their battle continues, a whirling dervish of blade against blade, until eventually, Valdor gets the upper hand and with an atom precision strike, cleaves into Oshitan's breastplate. He kneels over the defeated Primarch and is prepared to give him the mercy stroke. But Oshitan is not done talking. He tells him that long ago he told them that he pitied him and that he still meant it. Oshitan, now critically injured and lying on the ground, looks up at Valdor and tells him this. He says, quote, I've lived. My life was short and painful, but by the nine hells I lived. I'd rather have it that way than yours. No joy, no hate, no fear. Unbreakable without growth, immortal without passion. What more is left for you? What more can he take from you that he hasn't already? It's in this moment that Valdor has a vision of a far off time yet to come. Thousands of years later where the universe has descended into madness, the Imperium but a shell of its original design. He basically sees a vision of the 41st millennium. And even there, in the middle of it all, in the middle of chaos and the grim darkness of the far future, he is still unchanged. He's still cold and pure and steadfast, and he's unable to feel anything but the overwhelming pressure of eternal duty. Valdor plunges the knife into Oshitan's chest and ends the Primarch's suffering. After the last breath escapes from Oshitan, Valdor leans forward and tells him that there is nothing, there is nothing else for him to take.